I, I want to thank you and WVVA for being here as you have covered um, our sessions, I think, right from the very, very beginning. Um, let me say that last year, those people that were in attendance recall that we made a very sharp departure in the discussions that we had. We um, didn't talk much about land use planning, and it was all about preserving our waterways, our water. Um, and so the last session, we really zeroed in on the very, very thing that we talked about uh, here. And uh, water was the, was the issue. So um, these, as I always say, we have at least one or two things that we accomplish um, out of these, uh, these meetings. So they're really great. And the fact that the attendance keeps growing uh, is a true indication of uh, Jay, have a seat. Uh, is a true indication of uh, the importance of, of being here. I'll start with Peter Scully, a couple of minutes uh, to talk about 2012, which for DC was really defined by uh, two events. I think um, we'll all, we all recall. Hurricane Sandy being so fresh in our minds, we'll talk about that in a second, but the, also the Crescent Boat Fire, which occurred uh, earlier in the year in and around Manorville and the Brookhaven Lab area, was a wake-up call, I think, for a lot of people uh, in government and in the uh, firefighting community and in the fire-prone uh, communities in the Pine Barrens. I'm going to leave it to John Pavisic from the Commission to talk a little bit about the uh, multi-pronged approach. We have to respond to that. Uh, since October, however, uh, the work of the DEC has been just dominated and continues to be dominated by uh, efforts related to storm response and recovery. We're working on it every day. It changed the uh, landscape on Long Island, particularly along the coastline dramatically, as many of you know. And we're still coming to grips with just how to do that. The governor was quick to act, uh, creating a series of commissions to assess conditions in the wake of the storm. Uh, he's taking a leadership role in going, trying to advance uh, long-term strategies to deal uh, with those impacts and promote resiliency. And I'm sure we'll talk about this issue tonight. Just a, a quick plug for the government's budget, which, as many of you know, uh, proposes a $19 million increase in the Environmental Protection Fund by shifting uh, $15 million in unclaimed bottle deposits, um, and also supports uh, increased spending for open space acquisition, uh, climate change program that DEC uh, implements. We're pretty excited about the budget, and we know that the environmental community is too. Uh, I look forward to hearing from folks in the room about their comments and concerns want you to um, think about uh, open space and how we can be creative in finding ways to generate some dollars because um, good Lord is not making any more land. We need to preserve it uh, as quickly as possible because as the economy uh, starts igniting at some point, uh, we will be land will be more expensive and we will be in competition. So um, that's still, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a very critical goal that while we're kind of switching gears somewhat, we, we, we shouldn't lose sight of uh, land preservation. The concept here is that many of our organizations, many of your organizations, in fact, whether it be the Pine Barren Society, the Nature Conservancy, Group of the East End, the Baconic Baykeeper, uh, the Land Trust, and so many more, which I can't name because I only have five minutes, um, have worked for literally now two or three decades on preserving land and preserving groundwater and preserving our bays. And so many of the organizations are now banding together which we'll be announcing in April, but we're giving you a little preview here, Senator and Assemblyman. Um, and our slogan is going to be something like, it's the water, stupid. So um, for well, us... That directing that up. No! <laughs> I'm going to start this over. <laughs> but uh, on Long Island, obviously, in order to be sustainable and lasting and economically viable and livable, we need to protect our sole source aquifer. So what exactly does that mean? And what's the relationship between the aquifer and our groundwater? 
I'd like to introduce Dr. Mossy Bowman, who is a marine scientist with the Nature Conservancy. Thank you, Adrian. The population in Suffolk County has grown tremendously. I don't know what that was. <laughs> it sounded like Chris Gobler. So, uh, you know, like doing a Beyonce or your <laughs> <laughs> If I were doing a Beyonce, you would know it. <laughs> Well, we should, we should give a special thanks to Chris Gobler because we are using a lot of his slides and he has been the key scientist here at Stony Brook University who has come up with a lot of the findings looking at water quality and the problems with our drinking water and our estuaries and bays. So I'm going to try to talk as quickly as Adrian and spend one minute just presenting the problem. So as we know, in Suffolk County, we've had a significant population boom over the last 50 years or so. And with people comes wastewater. Uh, on, average, on average, there's about, uh, uh, people generate about 16 pounds per person per year in wastewater. So a lot to think about. And where it mostly goes in Suffolk County is in cesspools and in septic systems. Suffolk County has about 70% of the homes have, uh, are, are served with septic systems instead of uh, sewage treatment plants. And in the eastern end of Suffolk County, it's more like 90%. And it's not that the septic systems are working improperly. They're just not designed to contain pollutants such as nitrogen uh, or other chemicals that Adrian will, will go into. So what happens is that the um, effluent is treated, but it's still enriched in nitrogen. And it goes from the septic systems into our groundwater. Can you go to the next slide? Unfortunately, this program has occurred. Okay, there we go. So Suffolk County uh, recently released, uh, well, 2010, released a report, the Suffolk County Comprehensive Water uh, Management Plan, and it showed alarming increases in our groundwater. A 40% increase in our glacial aquifer and a 200% increase in our magazine. And all of that groundwater, which is the main source of fresh water to our bays and harbors, is making, their, making its way into our estuaries. And what the result is, uh, next slide, wondering if you can do it, um, is we're starting to see um, an expansion of harmful algal blooms. From 1954 to 1985, our Long Island waters were free of harmful algal blooms. Brown tide hit in 1985, and more recently what we're seeing are red tide blooms. And the problem with red tide blooms is that they come with harm, potential harm to people. Paralytic shellfish poisoning, if you eat shellfish, diuretic shellfish poisoning, um, or, or there's other um, poisons or toxins in the red tide that will kill fish. And, and, and people. I just want to make it clear that with the red tide, for instance, uh, seven people died of this particular paralytic shellfish poisoning in Alaska in the year 2011. So it's a very serious uh, uh, harmful algal bloom, um, of which we have, unfortunately, the largest algal bloom anywhere in the United States of America in Northport Harbor. And just one last point. what we're, what. Chris Gobler, Dr. Gobler has found from Stony Brook is it's fueled by nitrogen pollution. And not only is uh, the nitrogen, nitrogen pollution fueling the expansion of these red tide blooms, but also the level of toxicity. Of toxicity. So the, the potential for harm is increasing uh, over time. So one of the driving problems, obviously, is nitrogen loading into our groundwater. As the groundwater goes out into our bays and estuary, it's loading into the bays. But we don't want you to think it's only nitrogen, although that is a main culprit and a main problem with groundwater quality. But we also have other issues as well. Very quickly, obviously, the issue of pesticides. What we put on the surface ends up in the groundwater. Many of you know we've been waiting since 1998 for New York State to come out with the groundwater, I mean with the Long Island Pesticide Use Management Plan. It came out last week, only the plan to address pesticides unfortunately was thrown out and we were presented with a Long Island Pesticide Strategy, which unfortunately doesn't have any action items or any real direction on how to better address the 117 pesticides that we now find in our drinking water. 
Um, you can see here there's a large concentration of pesticides on the East End. Each one of these maps only illustrates one pesticide at a time. So the bottom left-hand corner is a pesticide called metaaxel. It's a fungicide. It's been found 1,327 times on Long Island. The second most common one is imidapropylate. Imidapropylate is a pesticide. Uh, it's been found over 890 times. Then the last but not least is atrazine. Atrazine is found 137 times and it's a weed killer. The European Union banned atrazine because of its uh, impacts in endocrine disruptor and low sperm count and uh, developmental problems in children. And what we did in America is we made it the number one weed killer used in America. And that also goes for Long Island. So we have pesticides are an issue. We need to address them. Volatile organic chemicals, this is a situation where we've met the enemy and the enemy is us. Um, VOCs are also been found prevalently across Long Island's uh, groundwater and they're increasing. PCE, for instance, one of the most common ones, uh, was found four times more in 2005 than it was in 1987. Uh, levels of TCE increased 150%. But what I want you to know about this and why it's important, most people think this is industrial pollution, right? You all think of it as being industry. No, no, no. If you look at that map, and I'm sorry, I know the map's a little low. You can't really see it, especially since I'm standing in front of this one. But literally, a lot of it is also coming from septic tanks, which means it's coming from household hazardous waste. So a lot of this can be associated with our behavior and products that we're buying and we're using. So we're going to need to change public behavior and change those products. Last one I want to talk about, which no one likes to talk about, but we need to talk about. Carrie Gallagher loves this one, too, from the Water Authority. Uh, emerging contaminant pharmaceutical drugs. As we know now that there are two ways that pharmaceutical drugs get into our water supply. One is through the natural biological process that we release them when we take them, but the other is by the improper disposal, throwing them out. It all goes somewhere. We throw them out, goes into a sewage treatment plant, and that plant's not designed to treat pharmaceutical drugs. Therefore, it's either discharged into the bay or estuary or right into groundwater. Keep in mind that Suffolk County has over 183 small package plants that discharge into groundwater. They can't treat for pharmaceuticals. The USGA has done numerous studies. In every single one, they're finding trace amounts. They're not a lot yet. They're trace amounts of steroids and antibiotics and hormones and uh, painkillers and you name it. So we always say we think our morning coffee should have cream and sugar and coffee, not Lipitor and Viagra and whatever. Um, Okay, what can be done? Oh, I'm really glad you guys asked because that's why we're here today. A number of things can be done, and as I said, you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the months to come, but we just wanted to give you a sample. For instance, what can New York State do, you may ask? What New York State can help do is change the, um, the standard for nitrogen in our water supply. Currently, right now, it's 10 parts per million. We're losing the battle. We're losing the battle on Long Island of protection of the resource, and we're losing the battle of the bays. So what New York State can do is lower that standard to give us a fighting chance. Next slide. Last thing is Suffolk County Legislature can also be excessively uh, active in this. We need, as was perfectly introduced, uh, a mechanism now to continue the land preservation program. I actually want to tell Legislator Karahan, I did not say to Newsday, there is no, land to preserve, there is no plan to preserve land. What I said was, there is no funding plan to preserve land for the future. I wanted to clear that up with you, thank you. So um, we need a funding plan, either state or county, to continue the preservation. Job's not done. The one thing, the one thing Suffolk County got right, we've got many things right, but at, I would say the best thing, when we preserve land, we have preserved the quality of our water. We do protect our bays. We do protect our quality of life. Everything we all said 20 years ago is proven true today. Everything. Every dollar we spent was worth it, and we need to continue along that path. So there were other items up there, but my five minutes is definitely done. Thank you so much for allowing us to speak. Um, a lot of the groups that are working together as a group, we appreciate that. I just wanted to touch base on what the uh, Central Pine Barrens Commission uh, accomplished uh, last year and what we're looking to do in 2013. As uh, Peter alluded to, last year uh, was consumed up until the uh, time of uh, Hurricane Sandy by uh, wildfire and wildfire response. So we've undertaken at the commission level a uh, comprehensive uh, plan to respond to uh, wildfire planning. First of all, we've redistributed and reissued 
the uh, commission's fire management plan because we know there have been uh, several several new generations of uh, folks at the fire response level, the fire service, who may not be familiar with that. Uh, we're also working on reissuing and uh, revising and updating that plan. We're also introducing uh, FireWise concepts into local uh, and community planning. FireWise is, is a, a basically a concepts that have come out of the West and more far, other fire prone regions to help uh, homeowners and neighborhoods protect themselves from wildfire. That includes doing uh, things around the house such as using fireproof materials for construction, but also trimming things as simple as, as trimming vegetation or not putting in vegetation close to the foundation, utilizing landscaping vegetation that is not flammable, using other materials such as landscaping materials uh, that, that are not going to be uh, uh, flammable to, at the time of a wildfire. So we, we're doing outreach. We've worked with the, a number of the local municipalities. We're working with the fire service. We're also working in conjunction with the Commission's Wildfire Task Force to, uh, to spread that forth. We also sponsored at our fall Wildfire Academy a course entitled Assessing Hazards in the Home uh, Ignition Zone. And that's geared toward uh, fire service personnel as well as uh, code <coughs> people, building inspectors, and so forth. We're looking to have another training session in that that also offers continuing education credits. We'll be doing that sometime later this year. In addition, we're working on a hazard mitigation standard uh, for the commission, something that would go into the comprehensive <coughs> land use plan, and we're hoping to uh, roll that out at some point uh, later this year. We're also working with the Wildfire Task Force to map surface water locations that can be utilized uh, for uh, helicopter and aerial uh, wildfire fighting. And we're also engaging in uh, more comprehensive training. Besides the fire academy that we had uh, in the fall, which is when we typically have the academy, uh, we're also having a, uh, for the first time, a spring fire academy that's going to be oriented to prescribed fires. And that's one other aspect that we're really uh, looking to aggressively uh, move on, and that is to expand the use of prescribed fire, which really helps and reduce the amount of fuel out there that can fuel a conflagration kind of uh, along the lines of what we had uh, uh, in uh, April of uh, 2012. Besides that, uh, we're also soliciting in, uh, information uh, and, uh, and data from the local fire department, and we're also looking to expand our fire weather monitoring uh, program. Um, in addition, we're working on amendments to the Comprehensive Land Use Plan. Uh, these are a set of amendments that were uh, first identified about five years ago, and we've been uh, working through those with the Commission. We were able to successfully get a number of those adopted last year, including one that pertained to uh, non-residential and credit allocation. And we've set up a schedule at the Commission to work through those uh, through a good part of this year. In addition, we're working on uh, a management plan for the Upper Carmen River watershed area, one that uh, deals with protecting preserved lands and recreation. One of the things we're looking to do is expand a very successful ATV and off-road uh, vehicle mitigation plan that we had used out here in, uh, in Southampton Town and uh, looking to expand that to the Upper Carmen River. We're also working on a comprehensive north-south trail pro, uh, uh, corridor and that uh, trail corridor uh, we are proposing to name after the late uh, Ray Corwin, who uh, was so instrumental in, uh, in protecting the Pine Barrel. In addition, we're working on stewardship. We, uh, the commission uh, successfully uh, authorized a, the issuance of a comprehensive ecological services request for proposals. We put that out to bid in, uh, in uh, the fall of last year, and uh, we're moving ahead on executing a contract with a a, uh, and a contractor that will help us really implement a lot of on-the-ground stewardship activities, including ecological inventory and assessment, prescribed fire and prescribed fire burn plans, uh, addressing um, uh, grassland management, and also seeking to address invasive species. In addition, we're, we're uh, hoping to work on some enforcement regulation, uh, which we don't have at the present time, and that's something that we feel is uh, sorely needed. And uh, we're also working on an agricultural uh, inventory uh, for the first time. Uh, Joe Bergell and I have spoken about that, and we're looking to try to uh, finish that up in the first uh, quarter of, uh, of this year. I'm going to intersperse elected officials as th throughout tonight. So the first elected official I want to recognize is 
Supervisor Anna Throne Holtz from Southampton. I uh, just wanted to share a couple of things that we are doing in the town of Southampton and, uh, and also with an eye towards a regional approach. Uh, we established in uh, 2008 um, our town uh, sustainability committee, advisory committee, and that has been uh, a great uh, success story for us in the amount of work that has come out of this uh, largely volunteer group, in fact entirely volunteer group, although we, uh, they interface with our uh, planning staff and, and other staff. We, um, we adopted um, our green building codes uh, in short order. They were some of the leading codes at the time, and I uh, want to thank um, our state legislators for introducing the, uh, the new tax exemption incentive for, uh, for the uh, lead uh, or national green building standards. Our Ramsenburg School District in the town of Southampton was the first um, to, uh, to adopt that um, as part of their uh, program. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, bringing that forward for public hearing and hopefully adoption in the town of Southampton uh, very shortly. Um, that uh, the Green Committee continued to work on. We now have an anti-idling ordinance in the town uh, with signs and uh, information out there, uh, including radio spots uh, to encourage people to uh, shut their motors off when um, when they are not uh, moving. Uh, we have a voluntary uh, plastic bags reduction uh, program out there. I think it's no secret to those who know that I was hoping for an out-and-out -out ban um, as some of our neighboring communities um, and uh, hoping that we will move towards that in, in short order. We, uh, in recognizing uh, the, uh, the issues around clean water, we uh, started the Clean Water Coalition, uh, which is really intended to be a... Um, a, a tool to keep uh, municipal leaders informed on uh, the work that is being done on a regional level there, how we can best participate on our individual municipal levels, um, the types of legislation we should be considering um, to support that effort. Um, and we uh, are hoping to work with the county on, uh, on helping uh, the completion of the Comprehensive Water Resources Management Plan. Um, we applied uh, with uh, others for a, a grant uh, through the Connie Green Growth, uh, with the Connie Green Growth at St. Glenis Ferry, to uh, look at a, um, a study uh, of uh, cluster treatment and decentralized water wastewater systems, which we got, and uh, we're working with her on that through our GIS department. I think it's it's a it's a very worthwhile effort, and. Um, we um, completed very recently uh, what I would like to pass about um, for others to look at. It is a sustainability uh, plan and element uh, that would, uh, when adapted, adopted, uh, be uh, made part of our town uh, comprehensive plan. It focuses on six major areas, um, education, water, economics, transportation and air quality, waste and quality of life. Uh, it was fully funded uh, through an energy efficiency and conservation grant. It enabled us to uh, hire Perkins and Will, which is a renowned uh, green urban design and architecture group. And um, we started the effort uh, by holding uh, community forums and um, envisioning sessions. And um, I think you'll be really interested to see in the way in which this has been developed. It has a real working matrices for how to address uh, issue by issue um, on, on, a, on our regional level, but also uh, to the town level. So uh, I'll pass that around, um, and I would encourage any other municipalities to, to, to look at, at the format, because I think it's a really uh, user-friendly and proactive one. Um, and we also started, uh, we uh, adopted a, um, a ramped up open space preservation program last year. Um, there are several people around this table that were part of that effort, um, and uh, we adopted an additional $125 million uh, borrowing plan over uh, the next, over the four years, including this year, uh, with the $30 million additional borrowing to what we are already doing uh, through our Community Preservation Fund with an eye towards preserving uh, at least an additional 2,000 acres over what we are otherwise preserving. It's, it's a pretty robust plan. And uh, we have uh, we've actually bought a lot of uh, property and open space uh, just in this last year. Um, I think I'll end with that. Thanks. Talk about 
how we are addressing uh, various uh, uh, problems. And as I said at the very beginning, actually identify one or two things that we want to focus on uh, both at the state, county, and even uh, the, the town level. Uh, I think the assemblyman wanted to comment. Just on the on the lead legislation, first of all, I want to uh, thank Frank Deline, who is here tonight. You know, for, this is like private sector, government, community, environmental leaders all working together, and and you know, certainly was uh, very important in the development of the the lead property tax legislation. And I wanted to express my thanks, first of all, to Legislator Schneiderman, who uh, sponsored the very first uh, local law to implement that in, for Suffolk County in, in the in the uh, state and also uh, to express my thanks to uh, uh, Supervisor Thronholz and Supervisor Romain who are both putting forward uh, local laws to do that on the town level. Uh, it just it, Since we are exchanging information, this particular bill is not just for counties and towns but also uh, for villages and school districts so that they can participate also. And, and second, I just wanted to take the opportunity also since uh, Anna mentioned the uh, Community Preservation Fund to just kind of give a brief uh, state of the fund uh, a statement. And that is number one, um, you know, everything with the fiscal cliff in Washington, it, you know, there was a silver lining and that is on the east end of Long Island, everybody wanted to close their real estate deals uh, in December before the capital gains tax went up, which resulted in a one month revenue burst in the Community Preservation Fund of $10 million for the month of December. Uh, but more importantly it, it is that the, after the recession, real estate and the Community Preservation Fund has really stabilized. The five, uh, the five towns generated $66 million last year, which is the largest sum since 2007 uh, for, for land preservation. And that, I think, is what allows towns like Southampton to undertake a very aggressive uh, land uh, acquisition strategy. Uh, the, the Community Preservation Fund really has been essential, I think, to allowing conservation to keep pace with development. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing I will say that n not only has the, the, the revenue stabilized, but I think the program as a whole is stabilized. You know, after we uh, did the, the state controller audit and addressed, found some issues that needed to be addressed, uh, really, uh, you know, the, the fund is back on track. And, all is, all is going well. So I, I thank all of the, the, the representatives here from the five East End towns for really uh, you know, continuing to do an outstanding job with the Community Preservation Fund. On that note, before I recognize Kevin McDonald and then to Camper, um, one of the things that uh, I will be moving forward um, is to ensure and it's been a, a vision of mine that every community have a central park, an area where the community can congregate and enjoy. In uh, Brookhaven Town, in First Senate District, we, we have a, uh, a park that we call the Wedge in Mount Sinai. And that, that uh, Wedge is so oversubscribed um, and it's a great place for the community to get together. Um, and there are certain uh, communities that in the initial, and I've had a discussion with Supervisor Romain, uh, there are a few communities I think that would be up front uh, for doing this to create a central park in those communities. But one of the things that we lack uh, that the East End has is a community preservation fund that has been passed by referendum and established into, into law. So that um, I know we get into uh, areas that preservation should be 100% of the time for preservation of the groundwater, but I think that we also need some land set aside that people can uh, recreate, communicate, and, and uh, enjoy. So um, I'm sure as uh, Supervisor gets his land lakes there in Brookhaven, uh, I think that he will be, uh, hopefully, 
uh, having discussions so that we can uh, really preserve in communities where the community wants a central park and we have uh, a piece of land that would be a natural uh, central park in those communities. Kevin? The notion that um, we get a couple of good ideas every year and, and you both have acted on them. I, I, I think you're, the one that comes from uh, last year that actually passed was the Watershed Improvement District law that will actually allow the towns to finance for individual homeowners and businesses the means by which we can implement capital projects on their property at government financed uh, rates, which is very attractive, in some cases almost close to zero financing, and allow individual homeowners to put that on their property tax bill and finance it over time. So upgrading septic systems and other things can now be done with greater ease, assuming we find the technology that's appropriate and has an appropriate price point. So I want to thank you both for that uh, specific act of the legislature that passed last year and, um, and encourage you both continue on in the, with the notion of trying to get the Long Island delegation to strongly support the, the increase in the environmental protection fund proposals. Uh, it would be great if it could be enhanced even more. Um, and that's, an, that's the state's only environmental investment fund. We need it as a partner for the rest of Long Island. It's essential. Uh, so your continued effort on that is appreciated. And then the last comment I make is just that uh, in the slideshow that folks saw earlier, that we have a real problem. And until, you, until we collectively, as a region, accept that doing business the way it's being done now, or has been done over the last decade, it's just no longer working. So whether it's groundwater contamination from nitrogen, or pesticides, or herbicides, it's all having an effect not only on groundwater, but on our surface waters. So um, if we want to change, we have to have an honest conversation about what we have doesn't work, and we now need to do it better. And everybody has a stake in doing it better, or we're actually going to be in a very worse off place. So thank you again, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. The other thing was the right to know uh, act that we passed when, whenever certain beaches, uh, certain areas are closed down, um, the community has a right to know what was going on. So there's greater transparency, discussion, and I think that will lead to the kind of pressure you need to uh, ensure that our waterways are uh, being treated properly. Dick? We need uh, all government to work with one another on all of these things. State can be particularly helpful in getting us a uh, water quality standard that works and also a mechanism, a schema by which we can enforce those regulations. That has to happen now. Long Island cannot continue to see water quality decline and have a healthy economy or anything else. Um, on the county level, we absolutely, those of you from the county legislature, cannot simply report that we do not have the funds to do this job. We have to get the funds to do the job. There's nothing that government is doing that's more important than the public health and welfare, and the public health and welfare depends upon our being able to protect our drinking water. They all go together, and in Brookhaven Town specifically, this is the year where state, county, and town officials are all going to help make that Carmen's River plant come together because it needs to for the sake of Suffolk County and for Long Island. Um, I have been using since um, uh, Assemblyman Thiel um, drew the analogy about uh, the cows and the pine barrens program, and I just can't help but conclude that that is utter nonsense. We've got to recognize County Legislator Sarah Anka. It's been a busy week. I know we had a very long legislative meeting on Tuesday, but we were able to pass the, um, the legislation that has to do with sales tax exemption on solar commercial installation. So again, I want to thank the state for um, supporting the, the state legislation for tax exemption. So we you know, hopefully complimented that. Um, and it's important because we have to get our solar installers um, incentive and the people that want that solar um, you know, the solar ability, we have to make it affordable. Life is running out of incentives. Um, the economy is tough. But if we can save, all the better. And if we can create a better environment by using um, you know, a, a 
uh, solar energy, reducing fossil fuel, let's do it. So again, thank you legislators for your support and, um, you know, and environmental advocates. You guys are, are amazing. We would, be, we would not be here without your support. It takes that voice, those questions um, to, to move forward. Um, just a couple things that, that my office is working on along with the legislature. Um, I'm chair of the Education uh, Committee, and we're, we're working to implement a comprehensive environmental awareness um, campaign in schools. So we're going to continue on that. We're just starting that. It's just started as, out as an idea, and I'm sure I'm going to need you. Um, I know we work with BNL together, but um, I'm looking forward to giving your advice, you know, Kevin, I mean, all of you, I can probably name each one. Um, so please call my office, email me, let me know, you know, um, what you feel was, is your priority as far as educating our children, because you know the kids are going to talk to their parents, and that's the best way to, you know, that if the kids, are, if the parents are buying them video games, and even though the parents maybe know that might not be the best thing, um, they're listening to their kids. If we can instill the idea of environmental priorities, they're going to talk to their, their um, children, are going to talk to their parents, and hopefully we can make a difference. Um, I wanted, I, I saw Joe recently in my office, Joe Gagella, and I also was at BNL um, this morning. So um, you guys need to get together because they have a, something uh, related to uh, reducing pesticides. And Adrian, I understand you, you know, trying to reduce the three top pesticides. I'm trying to ban them. Ban them. Excuse me. Ban them. Let me make sure that's, that's uh, uh, emphasized. Um, and we do need to because I was looking at BNLs. They're doing a lot of remediation and they're actually, they're almost, you know, well, not that they're complete, but they're doing a great job in re remediating their water pollution. Um, but we still have a ways to go and we need to stop doing that. What's the use of remediating the water? We keep putting the stuff back in the water. So, um, but we got to do it in a realistic way so, you know, we don't hurt the farmers. And uh, um, is Al here? Here's Al, our new legislator, our farmer legislator, yay. <laughs> first, first farmer. Yeah, so, uh, and also please join us on the BNL committee too. That's very important. Um, you'll get an earful, um, especially with water remediation. Uh, and again, I think it's important we can network the groups. How are we going to get more money for land preservation? Well, I think um, we need to connect um, our land preservation group with IDAs. Why can't we have corporate tax incentives? We need to start looking. Who has the money? Corporations have the money. Um, so again, not quite sure what to do. Maybe you guys have some ideas with um, corporate incentives with uh, land preservations, sponsorship, something like that. I don't know, but but you know, again, let's let's start thinking who has the money and uh, how we can preserve more land. Jay Power, I spoke with a constituent um, this afternoon prior to coming here, and um, you know there are concerns, environmental concerns, but whatever we can do to help clean up our, our energy needs, I think is is vital. I'm looking at my list, uh, and again, I'm almost out of time. Uh, so what's most important, and what we're learning here, is to connect, to network to find out how we can all help each other. You know, I see David, David, you're on the planning and you work with the IDA, right? Or with, yes. So I'm sure we'll be talking. Um, but again, however we can help each other, um, we, we have to just keep moving forward and, and don't allow any barriers. Out of this year, 2013, we've got to come up with a land preservation financial plan. That's what was mentioned. So financial plan for land preservation and the way we've always done it is state, county, town. So, um, Kevin, you're, you're always the creative guy. You and Dick Amper. So put your thinking caps together, truly. I, I got a couple of different things to mention this evening. Uh, first of all, Long Island Farmyards Organization, we have been trying very hard to find common ground with some people and organizations that we used to do a lot of headbutting. There are certain issues that are more difficult than others. So we do a little bit of that, but we do that in private setting. Uh, pet in public, punch in private. Um, any, anyhow, first thing I want to mention is that we do support the environmental community, and we would like to see the breaches on Fire Island left open. Um, we, and uh, what I've heard from scientists is that in fact it is not going to pose unreasonable risk to homeowners along the bays, etc. But the water quality with the breaches has improved greatly. 
for both recreational and commercial fishing, for the baymen, and for um, aquaculture. So uh, we think it would be wise to go slowly with EC and Army Corps, who have the responsibility for that, not to immediately close them without good consideration about what it really does mean. Second issue, land use planning, and it has been mentioned by a couple people about uh, long-term funding strategy for open space and farmland. I have actually just visited all three of the county legislators that are here this evening on this very subject. We concur with the environmental community that we need to look at this long term. When the economy picks up and the real estate market picks up, there will be a Long Island land rush. And if we don't have alternative programs of funding, there will be a lot of land that gets developed, very hard to farm with houses and uh, that situation. So we too agree that we need a long-term strategy for the open space and farmland program. Uh, third subject is a little bit more difficult, and that is about nitrogen loadings and the pesticide plan. I can understand why the environmental community is agitated and upset about the plan. However, it's not all bad. I read it over the weekend, which is extremely painful. Uh, it took uh, many hours to read the document. Uh, there are, I'm not going to go as extreme as, uh, as uh, Adrian on this one, but certainly uh, we too are concerned about pesticides. Uh, farmers, their families, their employees are at the front line of exposure. So we too care about the water and the environment. Um, the pesticide issue is difficult, it's very scientific. 95% of the things, you know, you say, oh my God, there's 100 pesticides in the groundwater. 95% are legacy. There are some of concern. We are willing in the agricultural community to discuss that. As long as we have bona fide alternatives that work to be able to farm, to protect our $300 million investment in agriculture and all the farmland that uh, is being farmed, uh, we need to have tools to protect that investment. So we can't totally, the same thing as I said last year, we're not gonna ban medicine. We're not going to ban cars and trucks on the highway despite fuel gets in the groundwater. Uh, so we can't just totally ban pesticides. They have a place in society. That's all I'll say on that tonight. We will discuss that amongst ourselves. Um, two more quick issues. Okay. Wildlife conference. We're working with DEC, with Cornell. We're going to be holding a wildlife conference. And what, what things can we do to help on that? That will be March 22nd. We don't have the location yet. Last thing, climate change. Okay, I went to the hearing last week that Bob Sweeney held. Uh, I missed Fred. He was on his way out and I was on my way in. But uh, a couple things. Here in Suffolk County, the overall temperature has risen two degrees in the last 50 years, and it's expected to continue to rise over the next 50 years. You may find it amazing that we, on average we have six days a year over 95 degrees. They're predicting 18 days a year over 95 degrees. That in fact, that, that we are in, uh, in climate, so we're warming. With that said, the weather events have been terrible for Long Island farming over the last three years. Done a lot of crop damage, flooding, We've had breaches of good prime farmland. Some of it is historic farmland back to the 1600s. I got a good call today for once that uh, said the Schumer weighed in and he has a very long reach. We've been able to get the federal government to uh, basically change their rules to allow uh, support for those farmers to fix their breaches, 2.4 million. And that's directly related to Schumer and Gillibrand weighing in to help us. And uh, Fred Peel actually has also been a help on that. He sent a letter to the governor to support our position about trying to get some of state assistance to help people. Two things for you. One very quickly first. A gentleman named Rad Dell, who I think both of you know sits on our board of directors. He couldn't be here this evening. He asked me to thank you for your ongoing work uh, to protect sharks. Uh, Montauk obviously is a fishing community. Uh, as a conservation organization, we've chosen to partner uh, rather than protest the slaughter of sharks and partner with folks to try to have uh, a better way forward, and you have both been instrumental 
in the support that you've provided for new legislation. What we do for a living is just simply professional courtesy. <laughs> okay. Well, in, in, in that case, I, I was starting to feel good about our relationship, but uh, uh, obviously I was, uh, I was flattering myself. Um, uh, so the, the second issue is uh, coastal erosion, coastal policy. Uh, it, it's not a surprise to any of us that uh, we really, you know, to the extent that our neighbors to the west took a direct hit uh, with Hurricane Sandy, uh, and, you know, obviously we, we wish them all the best and support their efforts, we're very uh, aware on the South Fork in particular that uh, we got lucky and that eventually uh, we won't be able to say that anymore. So uh, one thing that we've been working on over the last several years, and it seems like there's a lot more interest in it now, is the notion of having uh, a plan on the shelf in advance for how we react to these crises. Um, you know, I, I was heartened earlier in the week to see the $400 million that the governor has proposed for voluntary uh, buyouts of property owners who simply say, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I think it's an appropriate tool that needs to be laid on the table, but it's a single tool. And what we really need to do, I think, at the state level is get some leadership uh, in terms of trying to create what are the parameters for plans that communities should be encouraged to adopt. Several years ago, uh, there was $200,000 that was available through uh, New York State DOS. That was, I, I had no idea how it came online except that it was inherited from the feds, it was put into a pile, uh, and it was earmarked for a uh, community that wanted to take the lead uh, in doing some real innovative coastal zone management planning that is exactly of the type that we're talking about being needed now in the wake of the storm. Uh, unfortunately, no community stepped up and decided to take that money and it was ultimately repackaged and put into some uh, recovery relief program that uh, ended up happening in the Catskills. And I, I hope they made the most of it, but the, the reality is that we need state leadership to identify appropriate funding sources that could be used to encourage uh, exactly this type of planning. I mean, if we think about things like uh, LWRPs or comprehensive plans where uh, the state really serves as a re resource, and they say, here's the outline, here's the architecture. It isn't a plan, and we won't help you fund it unless you meet these minimum criteria. I think now in the uh, coastal policy, coastal protection realm, we need to call out as separate from things like an LWRP or a comprehensive plan exactly this type of document. You know, it, it's obvious to us that in Montauk, where we do have such a low-lying downtown, that uh, we need to have these conversations in advance of the storm. The emotions are too high, the needs are too imminent in the wake of a storm to try to think innovatively and creatively about where do we go from here. We need to sit down and have the hard conversations in advance. We need leadership and yes, money from the state to help us know whether we're in the box that's appropriate. What are the tools that are on the table? How do we pay for them? Which ones are voluntary? Which ones are compulsory? So I'm, I'm asking you for uh, your leadership in this effort. Uh, it's not something that hasn't been done in other states, and we can certainly look to them uh, to see what they have to offer. I'm on a budget subcommittee dealing with uh, Hurricane Sandy funding and the money that we got from the federal government. As part of that is to do things preemptively. Um, so this week or as soon as you could get to um, Supervisor Wilkinson and so forth, sit down so that we have some idea, and this goes for the other supervisors, and um, so that we know, uh, so that I know where we can access, I can access money for the communities here in Suffolk, particularly the ones that I represent, Mr. Thiel represents. There is also a proposal, and the governor talked about it, is smart development, not just keep building the same way over and over and just having the house washed out. So uh, there are a lot of things, and that's really a great, great point. We need to do it uh, by the first week. I mean, I need stuff by the first week in, in March. And we're just identifying all these different pots of, uh, of money. And um, so just get to Wilkinson uh, as quickly as uh, possible so he can interact with uh, both Fred and myself. Dave Colon, who is uh, chair of the Suffolk County Planning Commission, has uh, approached the uh, Regional Supervisors Association um, to develop such a plan. 
uh, with all of us working together. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty ambitious agenda. So I think, um, Dave, why don't you talk about it? Because it, it, it addresses exactly that and from a regional uh, perspective, because we all felt the need to come together. And the Supervisors Association, doing this together with the Planning Commission for the county, as well as the county executive's office, um, the idea is to do a Suffolk after Sandy uh, get together very similar to this one, focusing on exactly that, which is what are the res what are the things we can do in the next six months because we all know this storm season is coming back. Um, what can we do in the next? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dress warmly. Um, but, but the hurricane season starts again right in the fall. So uh, bottom line is, what can we do in the next six months to prepare uh, our communities, our towns? Uh, and then, of course, longer-term things, like how do we change zoning and those kinds of things, looking out, you know, things will take more like a year. Uh, but we're hoping to pull that together and do that in the next few weeks. So uh, bottom line, I think it's a great idea. One of the things we can talk about is how do we work with the, the uh, legislators to get funding to allow individual communities to kind of pardon and make quick decisions on that kind of thing. So. I'm Hal Walker. I'm the director of the Civil Engineering Program at Stony Brook University. I'm also representing the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences and Team uh, Yaakov Shamash, who wasn't able to be here today. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the new Civil Engineering Program and how it relates to the Environmental Roundtable and the things that you're thinking about. Um, the, the biggest element of it is we're really trying to structure this new program around the uh, design of sustainable and resilient infrastructure and community. Um, certainly, Hurricane Sandy brought to everyone's attention the need for the need for these kinds of things, and uh, we're actually we're teaming with the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, and, and Malcolm Bowman is here, and also uh, Geosciences and the Sustainability Studies Program. I think Martin Martin is here as well. And we're hiring a number of faculty over the next three years um, through that program to develop a, a program in, in sustainable coastal zone management and engineering. Um, so that's uh, that's really a key focus. And what we're, what we're trying to do is really have a research and, and education of students where they can see the interconnections between all our different systems. We've got our social systems, our economic systems, and, and our infrastructure systems, our transportation, water, wastewater, and, and the people of the research uh, really need to be focused on that. Um, that being said, I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is there really has been a chronic underfunding of infrastructure in the United States over the last few decades. Um, the American Society of Civil Engineers recently came out with a report that indicates that just in water and wastewater, there's roughly a $55 billion funding gap in terms of what is needed to update our, our water and wastewater infrastructure compared to what is being funded. And, uh, and they've also estimated that for every dollar in this funding gap, it actually costs businesses about two and a half dollars. So it's, it's affecting our businesses, it's affecting our labor markets, it's affecting our quality of life in, in all these different kind of, uh, kind of ways. Um, so trying to come up with new funding streams and being creative about that is, is key. Um, a metaphor that I think I, I want to throw out there to try to give you an idea of, of what we're thinking in terms of civil engineering on a longer term basis is uh, thinking of our infrastructure in terms of ecology or, or, or thinking of infrastructure ecology. Um, how do we learn from nature in terms of how nature self-organizes and evolves and how can we apply those principles for designing our civil uh, and water, wastewater infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure. So I think this idea of infrastructure ecology is, 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 is an area that we can really invest in on the research and education side, hopefully come up with some longer term solutions. Um, there's uh, certainly uh, the, the, the ecology and, and the natural environment has come up with very effective strategies for weathering hurricanes and, and nor'easters, and so we need to learn from that in terms of how we design our transportation. So we're going to be investing in research and, and people that can look at these kinds of questions. The zoning section of state law hasn't been changed in over four years. And the criteria that's in there makes it impossible for zoning boards to consider master plans, updated master plans, the term Hamlet study, the term smart road <coughs> didn't exist when town law and village law was created by the state, you know, 40, 50 years ago. 
And so when we have applications before us, an example is uh, the town to town study for Massic Beach, they have sold everything to one acre. There has never been an application that's coming before the planning board that was on a 50 by 70 plot that's been denied because of the five criteria in the state law has never changed. It doesn't allow us to look at the updated master plans or the Hammond studies and apply new criteria. So I've taken the trouble as a uh, former member of the Senate uh, Water Commission that wrote a lot of legislation and I put together two sentences which I think would cover it and probably uh, Fred Deal with his uh, background could also work on it. When a local municipality with zoning authority has completed a new master plan for the entire municipality or a community within its borders, such as a Hamlet study, or it's adopted a plan prepared by a regional planning entity or the governmental entity, and acts to adopt these plans and the recommendations, including changes of zones, then the previous section of state law for proving hardship shall not apply. Instead, the applicant seeking relief must show how the proposed project will not undermine the goals established in a new planning document of change of zone. And I think that's important in order to give us the ability to support the towns when they do these updates. Otherwise, zoning boards are going to continue to undermine the, the smart growth that we're trying to see implemented. I want to thank you guys. I've got six, uh, uh, six uh, uh, items here. I wanted to thank you first for increasing our reimbursement to soil water districts for $36,000 a year. And then just remind you, it's coming from the EPF, so you have to watch the EPF button to make sure that the money is put in there. Uh, two, Title 29 established a Water Resources Planning Council, and I think we voted for that set in the back in the late 1980s. An important significant law, however, the past DEC commissioners, including current Joe Martins, has refused to support the council. You and the governor appoint council members, although their terms have expired and the council has not met in two decades. So I hope that you would start the process to get that council back on track. Uh, last year, you supported legislation brought to you to add the Soil and Water Conservation Committee to the New York Ocean and Great Lakes Ecosystem uh, Act. I thought it was a very significant law for the first time. Uh, it codified the, the term ecosystem-based management as an important planning tool. Unfortunately, the task force hasn't met in two years. So I would hope that you would write a letter to Commissioner Martins and Secretary of State Corrales and ask them why they refused to meet. The South Shore Estuary Reserve Council that many of us worked on in this room has met maybe only once a year. Sometimes it hasn't even met at all. The staff office only has two people working in it right now, and many of the work identified in the comprehensive management plan 10 years ago still has not been done. And personally, I put together, I think, just three things that needed to be done. We need to focus on determining groundwater subsurface flow into the estuary based on the work that Suffolk County did. With the Peconic, we found that 40% of the flow of nitrogen was coming from some sub subsurface flow. We have no idea what that contribution is to the South Shore Estuary. It's an unknown factor, so we need to find out as soon as possible. Uh, the second uh, type of study needs to be done is to figure out what all the South Shore streams are that need to, the, what they're contributing to the bay. We know what some of them are, but not most of them. Uh, I think this is something that uh, Marine Sciences, working with USGS, could work on. And the big third other unknown is septic systems. In testimony that the New York State Legislative Commission on Water Resource Needs from Long Island received from both the State Health Department and the State DEC, they both indicated that some county septic systems are the least effective of all systems used for nitrogen removal in the state. They said in their testimony, the pile fields and leaching fields can remove up to 50% more. Suffolk County, however, will not allow them. You need to change the state law to eliminate the exemption you gave Suffolk County, giving them the sole authority to approve septic systems and instead return up to the state health department so they can approve these alternative waste sites. Mm -hmm. Just a brief comment on what my colleagues and I have been doing in the Suffolk County Legislature. Uh, we did pass two resolutions relating to alternative uh, septic systems. We directed uh, Suffolk County Health Department to study. Um, and that will bring that should bring some relief to the nitrogen loading. That's the hope anyway of the uh, of the estuaries. We also passed um, a resolution for a study of the loss of tidal wetlands, which is a concern. It obviously doesn't have anything to do with nitrogen loading because uh, spots spots trying to open a floor like any plant would love more nitrogen, and they certainly were thriving when the duck industry was thriving here. So that's a different problem. Hopefully we'll, we'll find some resolution to that. Um, one thing I'd like to ask, I mean, I'd like to thank our state officials, um, Senator Laval and Assemblyman Thiel, you know, it's for the, for the draft resolution for the, uh, 
you know, for the bill, for the home rule on deer management. Uh, that really, it, it relates on so many different issues. Agriculture, homeowners, um, the problem people have with deer hits with cars, you know, the accidents and actual deaths because of the deer on the highways. But, but one thing that's really important with deer management is the way it affects and it degrades our groundwater and our surface waters because the overbrowsing of deer, they eliminate all the undergrowth. We're getting increased erosion, and, and because of that, the water quality is suffering. And so we really thank you for that. Home rule is the way to go on deer management. I know the, the East End towns are going to be happy to work with Mr. Scully and all the people from DEC on programs that are going to make deer management more effective. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, as you heard with the preamble uh, in the opening remarks from Dr. Morphin and Adrian, obviously we have dire conditions of our local waters. Um, if you just look at the 303D list, it's um, monumental, it's right, quite frankly. In the last 10 years, we've seen the entire South Shore added to that list, and all roads are leading to nutrients, and I think there's finally some acknowledgement that wastewater is a principal cause. And not surprising, when you look at the groundwater, uh, surface water nexus, it's all, all there. Um, I do want to speak to the reg cell, because I think this is really important. Uh, the Clean Water Act is now four years old as of October 17th, I believe. Um, you know, it's a really sound, founding uh, environmental law that's you know, obviously devised to protect our waters. On a state level, we have to see that. Uh, ultimately, regulations are extremely important. And ultimately, when we look at um, protection of these waters, I mean, the science is out there. We're looking at about a half a part per million milligrams per liter nitrogen to cause these impairments. And we've been, again, devising regulations for drinking water protection at 10 parts. So there's a 20-fold separation there. Um, again, there's recognition of, of the problems. But hopefully, I think if we start trying to deal with uh, groundwater levels, um, as maybe suggested earlier, I think it's wrought with difficulties. It's going to be very difficult to determine uh, whether or not a certain level of nitrogen is leaving one's property. Uh, it's going to, uh, again, require monitoring wells, uh, what's happening up gradient. So I think we have to go to end of pipe. And this is where the state of New York and Suffolk County has to get focused and start uh, really, I think, uh, monumental changes in, again, wastewater discharge regulations. That's what we can deal with. Uh, we know the technologies exist. We can treat, you know, on a municipal level down to two or three parts, even on on-site um, commercial property or, or uh, residential property down to three or four parts. The county is approving these technologies slowly but surely. We have to start seeing them implemented, and that's where the requirements come in. Um, the DEC, uh, and this is for Mr. Scully, and, and actually the uh, assemblyman as well as the senator, back in September we submitted a petition um, the DEC identifying thousands of uh, sewage treatment plant violations, the speedies permits. Uh, it was well-founded law, again, tied to the Clean Water Act. Uh, to date, there's been no response from the agency. And unfortunately, there really is no timeline, but I think it's uh, poor regulatory management, poor policy, when, again, the effort that went into this petition is gone unanswered without any, uh, any conclusion or even uh, a legal response to it. Um, Numeric standards. Uh, ten years ago, EPA uh, required the states to promulgate numeric standards for water quality protection. Again, these are real numbers, how much nitrogen is in the water column, how much bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, New York State has been slow in uh, coming online with this, and I'm afraid as they are promulgating and having talked to Albany, um, there's well-founded science that is being brought forward to really substantiate what is water protection. I'm afraid this is going to turn into a, a political issue whereby it, it does not see daylight, quite frankly. And currently we're on a, new, I'm sorry, a, a narrative standard, which is just, again, once again, not enforceable. Uh, the last thing, and I'll resonate with others have said, uh, Hurricane Sandy brought a blessing with all the damage, and that's the uh, old inlet breach, or new inlet breach. And I think it's uh, a great opportunity. It's being monitored closely to really give some, breathe some light into a bay that is in decline. So to the extent that you have influence over, uh, again, the state of New York, 
Um, let's keep that breach open. Thank you. I'm Vito Manet. I'm, I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension. The CCE that doesn't knock on your door and, and ask you for contributions and, and to sign. Uh, uh, but but I, I think I want to set a more optimistic tone and, and, and move focus. This is impressive how you've grown this group over the years about uh, uh, cooperation and balance. When I, when I started with the county the, the, uh, uh, about 45 years ago, uh, the population estimates for Suffolk County reached beyond 3 million to close to 4 million. And I was handed as a young civil engineer a pile of, of, of sewering reports that actually showed sewering out to the Montfort Lighthouse. And the, and the point in, of this background is to really set the stage as to how far we've come. We've been hearing things about technology. Technology has advanced incredibly over the ensuing 40 years uh, that I've been involved in environmental protection. And uh, not only in terms of industrial waste pollution, sewage treatment uh, technologies improved, but all that. But, but, uh, but I have a couple of points to, to, to make here. Uh, uh, th there is a need to continue to infuse real science into a lot of these debates. A lot of personal opinion comes in and, and God bless us, we live in America and you're all entitled uh, you know, to your, uh, your opinion. Uh, again, the idea of uh, explosive population growth, true in the 60s and 70s, but certainly in the last decade or so. Southold, I think, has gone up a couple of thousand people. And again, it, it, it really goes to the heart of land use. Uh, uh, we, we do a lot of water quality management planning when I was at the uh, health department. And quite honestly, over 10 years ago, when I introduced the idea of the insidious problems of pharmaceuticals, a lot of you older guys snickered around and you know who you are. But I'm, I'm glad a, a, a woman discussed it today because quite honestly, then and now, uh, the, the pharmaceutical and the problem of, of primary concern to environmentalists is estrogen, the female hormone and estrogen mimickers. So I'm going to advise some caution here about controlling pollution at the source. Uh, I, for one, would not advocate controlling women as a source to, uh, as a means to controlling pharmaceuticals. But, but, but the point I, I really want to make uh, deals with agriculture. Uh, what, what, I thought I treated that differently. <laughs> My last point, Senator, it, it deals with agriculture. And uh, uh, as the long-term director of, uh, of the Peconic Estuary Program, and they replaced me with something smarter, which, which goes to show you how well I was respected in my former position, uh, there was really the, pers the perspective of that entire program was environmental protection, groundwater protection, surface water protection. And when we had a survey, what the people of the East End said they wanted to preserve most of all the amenities, open space, wetlands, water quality, shell fishing land, was agriculture. And that's what I reached out to uh, my friend Joe Gagel and said, hey, we've we got to get over this, this confrontation. So my point here is, is if we proceed in a balanced and cooperative manner, we can address it. Say what you may about the current state of the, uh, of the pesticide strategy, but I think it infuses the proper tone. The idea that we have to prevent the, pu the adverse public implications of chemical use while preserving uh, the, the very much needed agriculture. And where I'm at at Corporate Extension, we're trying to promote buying local. We're trying to provide food security for the, for the low income people. I just met with my staff. The food stamp program is being gutted. It's not a good time to be poor in America or in Suffolk County. So we're going to have to be able to provide uh, for our people and hopefully uh, or, you know, provide produce locally. If you all want to buy uh, uh, you know, produce from Chile, you know, that may be your future. I think we have the capability to make sure that Suffolk remains the number one agricultural county. And my point to you and your colleagues is we need to have a forum about enhancing agriculture. I just wanted to point out that um, uh, the, if we don't underground our utility wires sometimes, we're going to keep going, having the same problem over and over again. I'm hoping that somehow through, through the uh, legislature, state legislature, uh, you can almost force uh, you, you know, electric 
utility to underground their wires. I know in many towns, the uh, planning department exists and when there's a new subdivision that the utility is underground. It, but uh, we could save a lot of money uh, in the long run. The I Senator Laval, this is my first time here. I am a little nervous. I probably will read off the paper a little bit. And it's something that is very, very important to me, and I may want to make sure it comes out right. Um, we are, uh, I am Deborah Schmidt. We are fourth generation farmers at Philip A. Schmidt and Sun Farms here in Riverhead. Um, we have uh, two sons. That is our fourth generation. They are graduated from college, uh, college uh, Matthew 28 and Philip 30. Matthew is full-time on the farm, Philip is part-time. We are commercial growers, meaning we grow food for many people. This is how we make our living. We are in the business of farming. On our farm, we work together with scientists at Cornell Cooperative Extension. We are a part of the Ag Stewardship Program, and I'm going to read it right off the flyer. I have brochures here, if anybody would like one to read about it. Senator LaValle, I don't know if I gave you this in July, but I will give you a copy. It says here, the Ag Stewardship Program was established in 2004. It addresses environmental concerns, it protects water quality, and it preserves the business of farming. We follow safe methods in our farming practices, whether we are conventional or organic farmers. One method we use on our farm now is using compost and less synthetic fertilizers. Pesticide is to plant as medicine is to human. We as farmers practice preventive met methods, and the last measure we use is pesticides, plant medicine for disease and pests needed to grow good crops. There is no going around it. Just like humans, sometimes they need medicine as well when they are ill. My husband worked 20 years ago with Cornell to set up the integrated pest management program for cabbage. Us farmers have been working with the scientists for a very long time. Our largest crop, our specialty crop, used to be spinach. We grew 100 acres. We now grow less than 10 because we no longer have good weed control. To add to misery, because certain pesticides are banned on Long Island, but allowed upstate New York and our neighboring states, we are losing our competitive edge as profitable ag businesses. These past few years have been a struggle for the Long Island farmer. We are losing the battle. We need pesticides or plant protectors, whatever you want to call them, to grow food. We work with the scientists. We go to pesticide classes to use pesticides safely to grow safe food. No pesticides no commercial growers, no food. There are only 2% of the population in the United States that are farmers. Only 5% of the farmers grow organically. It is impossible to feed the world on these facts. The United States grows the safest food in the world. Zero tolerance of pesticides will put us out of business. We are almost at the point where we just might have to quit. It is a very emotional decision for a farmer. You are attacking us because we grow food responsibly. Science, not emotional, although I'm a little emotional tonight, I'm sorry. Facts, not fear. Things, in moderation. I am 55 years old and have eaten conventional food all my life and drink Long Island water. My doctor says I'm healthy and to keep up the healthy lifestyle. Emotion and fact. I would never feed my family something that would make them sick. 
I trust and I choose science. If you continue on the path of pushing for zero tolerance, you will lose the future farmers, Philip and Matthew, and the other young farmers, because they cannot survive as Long Island farmers due to over-regulations. Zero tolerance equals zero farms. Grown on Long Island will be history. Thank you. One of the things that Adrian talked about is, is a lot of household pesticides that, you know, and uh, I truly meant what I said. I think uh, you two should really have a conversation because you're on the ground and you could, you know, give important information as you did to me back in, in July. So I am Beth Batteni from Renewable Energy Long Island. I used to work at the National Coalition Against the Misuse of Pesticides, so I hope to be a part of that conversation. <laughs> Um, but I'm here today to talk about energy, to follow up on some of the comments about climate change and Hurricane Sandy. Um, we're very concerned about all the changes happening with LIPA, our, our utility company. Um, as we know, the, the governor would like to make some changes, and every day we open the paper is something else. So to whatever uh, degree you have influence, um, we just want to make sure that the existing energy efficiency and renewables programs do continue. They have some great programs that are existing now. Um, the the uh, Board of Trustees had adopted a 400 megawatt RFP last October, and we want to make sure that that initiative continues and even grows, actually, I mean, if I should be so bold. Um, as far as we understand, LIPA is not meeting the state targets, the 45 by 15, and we'd like to see them do their part to meet the state um, RPS standards. And this would include offshore wind. We strongly advocate wind. There's a few projects in the pipeline. And uh, we'd like to see the state do its part to move those forward. Um, and I would point out that um, RELI, Renewable Energy Long Island, um, conducted a study. We released it last year called the Clean Energy Vision from Long Island. And it actually found that we could provide all of Long Island's um, energy needs using renewables by the year 2030 um, without any, with, with the actual, with the technology that exists today. No, you know, problem other than the cost would be, uh, would not be a, a, a problem. It's more just the political will. So that's where I'm coming to you saying, um, wherever way you can influence this, we'd appreciate it. And I would point out that there are a few open seats on the LIPA Board of Trustees right now. So. <laughs> and more um, each day. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's an opportunity for us to look for good people to be on the board to help make good decisions to push us in the right direction for the future. Thank you. And also I would thank you, Ms. on a personal level, on your work on BPA and, and the county's work on BPA for the public health. Thank you. Everybody in this room, uh, something is going to happen with the Long Island Power Authority this year. and It's something we're going to live with for probably decades. So people should pay really close attention. I don't think anybody... Uh, can defend the status quo of the way that LIPA has been operated and has become really more of a political ener entity than an energy entity uh, through the years. But, uh, you know, in crisis comes opportunity, and if Long Island is going to finally take back its energy future, there's going to be the potential to do that this year because, uh, you know, as I said, the status quo is going to change. Uh, but I am very very skeptical about what the governor is proposing as far as privatization. Uh, been there, done that, didn't work out real well. Um, so uh, but we, hopefully all of the alternatives will be looked at and uh, you know, people in this room should be very mindful of it because it's going to have an impact for a long time. Uh, we have an undergraduate major now in coastal environmental science, uh, which started about a year ago. And uh, we also have at graduate level, we have now a, a advanced uh, graduate certificate in GIS, which I think is very useful to people. And it's all, that uh, advanced uh, certificate is done online mostly and in evening classes. So for those of you that have an interest in learning more about GIS, you can either take one course, multiple courses, you can actually lead it all the way up to a, uh, a certificate. Uh, 20 years ago, I started a uh, program in hydrogeology a master's program, and we're now revamping that to be online mostly. So um, that I think will be useful to people that are working and that have busy schedules and uh, have trouble getting to study books. So I think that's that's the update. Maxie Grant, you know us as a SUNY-wide institute located at Stony Brook. 
We also have staff who are part of Cornell Cooperative Extension. We fund um, research throughout the state in important coastal problems and also have extension agents who work with coastal communities. I just want to, and we're also part of a national network of, of 33 programs throughout the U.S. and get both state and federal funding. I want to mention two things we're doing and two things we would like to do more of. First, um, Adrian talked early on about all the work that Chris Gobler has done with harmful algal blooms in this area. Um, much of that work was funded by New York Sea Grant over the years, either directly by us in partnership with us, or we funded pilot studies that then allowed him to get additional funding from other agencies. So we've been very heavily involved in that. We've also supported um, many decades of other harmful algal bloom and, and water quality research in this area. Uh, secondly, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, we've been very involved with a number of issues. We um, are supporting the research that's evaluating the impact of the breach um, on the physics of the, uh, of the bay at the moment. We were the authoritative group that put out a, a report 10 years ago on um, on breach impacts that's still the authoritative document I have copied for you. And we have a number, a couple of our extension agents who are working with both the fisheries community and also municipalities in terms of responding to Hurricane Sandy and its impacts in the future. Um, things we need as a, as a um, SUNY White Institute are additional help to, to bring uh, additional outreach to communities, both in terms of Sandy and in terms of water quality. The Regional Economic Development Council has talked a lot about big infrastructure and things like this, but before such things occur, there's a lot of need to provide additional education to communities and um, citizens about the issues on Long Island and both in terms of Sandy and in terms of water quality and in terms of what needs to be done. Um, and of course, also must be the best science-based uh, information coming through the university. Chair of the um, Legislature's Environment Committee, it's very important that um, I was invited today. Thank you. Um, three critical areas I want to touch on. Um, and if I'm repeating anything, it's on purpose, it's for emphasis as chair of the committee. Uh, you know, some things just couldn't go unsaid by me. Um, open space preservation. Clearly the county's at a crossroads. Um, I, when I started as chair of the committee uh, a year ago, you know, I was told by advocates, many in this room, um, that we had these master lists that were developed and um, the county doesn't even know which properties have been purchased on the master list, which properties have been developed or sold. And um, so we undertook a, uh, a review of all the master list properties, which um, was just presented to us uh, this past month um, in the first EPA committee of the year. And that, that's finished. There's more to do, there's no question. The number one issue on open space for Suffolk County is money. There's absolutely no question about that. We. Um, you know, we did the accelerated program, we borrowed against future revenue, and now we're at the place where we're at PAYGO. We, um, it's critical for us moving forward to finalize the priority list, to review the process, to ensure we're spending our money to prioritize water quality, climate resiliency, which is clearly the new buzz phrase, agriculture, um, but to find more ways for money. The financial plan for land preservation is very important, and that's the next step. Um, I wish we could have done it sooner, no question. Um, nitrogen reduction. Um, we are helping to fund Chris Gobler's work um, on studying and monitoring harmful algae blooms. We just provided uh, more funding to finish the evaluation of the innovative alternative sewage disposal system. And I'm very excited about the funding we just approved on Tuesday. Uh, the new pilot study for clustered treatment of decentralized wastewater, um, and which hopefully will show the effectiveness of retrofitting so that communities with 70% of Suffolk County with no sewers, if we can retrofit some key critical um, communities near the water, yes, okay, um, that's, that's very important. Pharma, on pharma, we really need the state's help. 
pharmacies should have to take back the medications they sell. Um, I've tried, I've, I've worked with council. I don't really think there's a mechanism for the county to do that. The state has got to help us. We have our um, operation medicine cabinet, uh, whereby each of our precincts will take back medications. That's just not convenient enough for people. They should be able to take them back and have to um, take them back where they buy them. I think that's critically important and the state can work with us on, on making that happen. Um, I've met with each of my hospitals. You know, they've talked about uh, at the source, you know, getting people to know not to flush, not to throw away, but if they could just bring it back to the pharmacy where they got it, you know, it would have a world of difference. I just wanted to thank you, um, Senator Lavelle and um, Legislative Deal for sponsoring the GMO labeling bill. This is incredibly important. Uh, new studies are showing massive birth defects, digestive disorders, tumors, horrific health effects from GMOs. And once they're labeled, 5% of the customers contact the company, tell them we won't buy GMO products, they're out the door. That's already happened in Europe. So it's terribly important that this bill be brought to the vote. And um, also, could you please urge Governor Cuomo not to allow fracking in New York State? <laughs> gallons of water have already been polluted in, in Wyoming and Pennsylvania. I'll finally let um, Legislator Schneiderman. Um, every summer, the county comes and dumps pesticides in a pond on our property with all beautiful wetlands and we've kept this property completely organic. We've gone and talked to the county and asked them not to do this and they just told us to get lost. On behalf of John Halsey and Peconic Land Trust, um, of course, creative solutions to future funding for land protection is a paramount issue. And uh, the private uh, conservation easement tool is some, sometimes overlooked. Uh, we're all talking about funding. Let's remember that uh, the, fed, the federal government just uh, re-upped the uh, enhanced conservation easement incentive. It's, uh, it's an example of how property, uh, how tax uh, incentives can contribute to private conservation at no cost to the public sector. Uh, it's a very important tool along those same lines for open space conservation easement donations. We need to be able to uh, predictably um, uh, predict property tax assessment practices and we're working with Assemblyman Thiel on models for improving consistency for property tax assessment and tax abatement for properties subject, subject to conservation easements. It's an it's incredibly important tool, particularly in the higher value uh, uh, portions, uh, areas of our, of our community. Um, we are, uh, also we want the private conservation easement component uh, to be a factor at the table as we're thinking about full storm response Let's, again, not just think about how we can purchase people out of harm's way, but also incentivize them moving and, uh, and including the potential for donated land uh, tools to be a part of that. And lastly, in response to Assemblyman Thiel on farming, uh, keeping uh, protected farmland and agriculture, the Farms for the Future initiative, there's lengthy uh, material about that on the Conic Land Trust website. There are already now a new school of comparables agricultural land that has been further protected beyond the purchase easements uh, to uh, assure that it can only go to farmers, thereby reducing its value and creating, as I said, a new school of comparables, a new um, category of farmland that will, will necessarily stay in active agriculture. We talked about the pesticide issue, land preservation financial plan, the uh, pharmaceutical issue and other hazardous materials that we need to get our arms around. Hurricane Sandy request uh, water point regulations were mentioned by the Baykeeper. Uh, and I just want to, the last words, certainly I want to thank my partner here. Uh, it's great working with, with Fred. We really communicate very, very well. I want to thank Stony Brook University, you have no idea of how they weigh in each and every day 
in consultation in so many ways. So to have that university uh, in our midst is just great. Uh, be safe, be safe tonight, be safe with the storm, and thank you all for attending.